when I started really embracing who I am and showing up in that way, that is when my business really started growing. And it was a little bit scary because like I said, some people might be turned off by it. But what was happening was maybe some people were turned off, but the people who were connecting with it were really connecting with it. You're listening to the Copywriter On Call podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gillis, copywriter, word magic maker, and owner of What Sarah Said. On this podcast, you'll feel empowered to show up online in a way that has you saying, that's so me. Let's get started. Welcome back to another episode of the Copywriter On Call podcast. I'm your host, Sarah Gillis, and I am logging some on-call hours today with an industry friend of mine and an art teacher turned content marketer and graphic designer. I am so thrilled to welcome Deanna Seymour to the Copywriter On Call podcast. Hello. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be here. Oh, thank you so much for being here. I'm thrilled. So I would love to take a few beats just to have you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are, what you do, and your journey from where you came from in education to where you are now. Yes, as you said, I'm a graphic designer. I like to call myself sort of the visual side of people's content. And I just, as you said, former art teacher. So I think I just make your content more fun and more appealing. As much as we want to say we don't judge a book by its cover, I really think that copywriting and visuals work so well together. One is not more important than the other, but I do feel like the graphics hook them in. But if the copy falls flat, then we know it doesn't. You don't want to hook them into nothing. So it's such a little match made in heaven. So I just feel as the former art teacher in my career path, it just led me right to this. When I found out about online business, I was like, okay, I was getting a little disgruntled as a teacher. And which I always say, props to anybody who's out there being not an art teacher, because Oh my gosh. I was always like, I can't imagine if I was a real teacher the whole time. My third grade friends and all the people who had to pass tests and do the data. And even I had to do data. I had to do as the people are crazy for data. It's ruining everything. But (laughs) even as the art teacher, I had to do pre-tests and teach something that was very structured, the proportions of a face or the one point perspective and do an after test and turn in everybody's drawings and grade on a rubric and I did grade on rubrics often, but anyway, I'm going down an education route, but I'm just saying all the data. I, that's, but you know what? I talk on podcasts a lot about how I don't like data. And as a content person and marketing person, people think that I should. And I literally just now, this is like therapy. I'm like, that's why I'm triggered. I don't, yes. I hate all the numbers. And I'm like, too many spreadsheets in my past, too many principals asking me about data and data that I'm not into it. <laughs> I'm Anyways, with you. I'm here now. I'm in my safe space. I'm in my home office and loving life, helping people bring their fun, creative ideas to life. I love that. I love that. I'm totally with you, the data part of it all. And I was mostly a college level teacher, Mm -hmm. but I also taught it for a year in middle school gifted ed. And that was a data heavy game, just so much stuff and so much reporting. And am I doing what I'm supposed to be doing? And did I adequately prepare my students for X? It was just, it was so stressful. But I, I gotta be honest with you, it was a little bit triggering when you're like one point perspective, two point perspective. Oh my gosh, that was horrible. <laughs> I was a horrible at that in art class. Probably one of the only ever B's or C's I got. I was, uh. I'm a high achiever. I was an A student, but those, that gives me hives. Cool. <sighs> If anyone goes to my website after this, you will see that I don't love a ruler. <laughs> I'm not that kind of person. I don't like that either. So also it's crazy. I don't know. Even the proportions of the face. I mean, you got to learn the rules to break the rules, which I think is my design style. Mm-hmm. But once I learned them, I like immediately started breaking them. So yeah, it was, that love was it. my least favorite lesson. I feel like I was even like totally transparent with the students. This is going to be whack. Here we go. We got to do it. Take this test. Do this thing. <laughs> Get to do the thing. Yeah, so I won't get fired, even though we're just wasting two weeks doing something that as a professional, I don't even think we should be doing, but whatever. I'm with you there. (laughs) I think that it was assignments like I taught my brother that he liked all of that stuff. He's an engineer, civil engineer now. And it's like when I had to do that stuff and not be creative, I was like, oh gosh, there's too many (laughs) rules. I'm going to break all the rules. Oh, I just felt so confined. So it makes me feel good that that's not necessarily a comfortable space for other people to So tell me a little bit about how you came from education and kind of decided to take your own spin on things and bring all of that creative energy into your business. I honestly, as an art teacher, I'm just have been very creative my whole life. I feel like I've had a million side hustles. My friends are always like, oh gosh, here goes Deanna starting something new, starting something (laughs) new. Not going to lie. Some of it's been MLMs. I go to a Jamberry party and I'm like, oh my gosh, you can make your own custom nail wraps. I want to do that. It's just, I've done everything. Yeah. And I really love the part where you start everything. You're branding it. You're making a logo. You're coming up with a name. 
you're picking those brand colors. And then I am also a diagnosed adhd -er. So it fizzles for me. And I'm like, mm -hmm. oh. So what, hap what would happen is like summer months, I feel like I'd start a new side hustle. And then like probably the next summer is like a new side hustle. So the way that the school calendar worked, it gave me time to flex that creativity. Yeah. But also it's not really cost effective to just keep doing your businesses. And it's funny too, because some of them were successful, but I would just get bored and be like, Meh. nope. So when I realized, oh my gosh, I can help other people do all the things I think are really fun and that could be my job. And so I can actually stick with it, yeah. but live vicariously through my clients and help them come up with fun stuff and fun names and fun logos and colors and do all the fun stuff. That's when I was like, oh, that's something I can stick with. Cause it's just really fun. Each time I start with a new client, it's a whole new fun adventure. So that was my path of me doing it over and over again. And then being like, oh, actually I could use all my training as an art teacher and art school and all that to help other people do this. That's I love sort of that. how I came to be in this weird online business world. I love that. I love, I too love the like diving in with a new client and getting to know their brand voice and getting to know who they are as a service-based business or as a product-based business, just who they are and why they serve who they serve. And I love the constant change, right? Like even if I work with a bunch of photographers, which is really my niche, each photographer has their own spin. Each photographer has their own style. And it's such a beautiful thing to try and balance all of those voices, but to be able to immerse myself in those as well. So I love that because it's like you get to start a new brand new business every time you <laughs> meet someone. It's great. Yes. So fun. And it's really fun. I think the teacher in me likes helping people through that too, you know, because that's hard, it's hard work and it's hard to figure out your voice and your messaging and just what you're, how you're going to show up as a yeah. business. I think it's interesting that you just said service providers and products because it's two different, like when you are a service provider, mentally, I'm like, you're not your product. If you don't sell something in a launch, it's not you, it's not your self-worth. Right. But I do think there's a lot of overlap the way I look at it and other people would disagree, but the way I look at it, if you're a personal brand and like people are going to have to work with you, if people are going to show up on Zoom and see me, I should probably be marketing so they know what they're getting into because yeah. otherwise <laughs> we'd be really disconnected. They'd show up on Zoom and be like, who's this crazy art teacher lady? I don't know. <laughs> False advertising. You know what I mean? I was, so Yeah. I was actually creating some content about that today. One of the most common things I hear from my clients is that desire to be taken seriously and to sound quote unquote professional. And it's but professional is missing the boat, right? Professional can be part of what you want to portray, but it's not the whole story. People need to know who you are and feel a connection to you. And part of that is getting rid of what's safe or what's generic and embracing who you are. So can you talk a little bit about how you help your clients to do that? How you help them to embrace their quirky and bold selves and yeah. just show up as they are? Totally. I think like you were saying, you work with photographers. I think the professional way you're going to show up is your portfolio. Not anyone could take a bit good picture, but we could look at a bunch of portfolios. But the way I'm going to choose my photographer is by number one, their style. That's going to speak for itself too. But also just, is it going to be fun? For me, mm -hmm. I'm someone who just values having fun. <laughs> I don't know who would be like, I want my photographer to be real, a real drag. I really yep. want it to be not fun. <laughs> it's very important to me. I feel like my kids are expecting it to be fun. And I just think my family is silly. My family's silly. So someone who is okay with that and not going to be like mad at us if we're not doing what we're supposed to. And someone who values fun also so they can capture that fun instead of thinking, oh, I'm going to wait till they like get serious and take a picture. Right. Gosh, one time <laughs> I was with some friends on a hike and we asked a passerby to take our photo and we all flashed up a peace sign or did something. We were in our 30s. And mm -hmm. then the person took it and then said, now do you want me to take a real one? And we like laughed about that for years because we were like, we all were like, okay. And so we took a really awkward one. We we're all just standing and smiling. <laughs> and we we're like, that's not the real one. The real one is the one you took first. So my point is someone who would get that, whoever that photographer is, but also someone who doesn't like fun, but wants something different, is looking for something different, would have to choose someone else. So I think in that sort of way, the professionalism can speak for itself on what your work is technically. Maybe you want like your links to work. You want if someone clicks like book a chat, you need that to do that. You need your mm -hmm. systems to work. So I think that's what we can leave to being professional. And I think the rest of it is show up in a way so that people are going to remember you and they might remember you by being like, ooh. That girl's I don't, like her. I don't like her pink hair, which is fine because when they show up and I have pink hair, they're going to see me. And I'd rather them just decide that before we move forward. Like, I'd rather you not book a call if you don't want to work with me. If you think there's too many colors, like in graphic design, and you're like, whoa, that girl is way too much when you go to my website, 
then that's okay, but you have to pick a different designer because that's what I do. With it, not everything I make looks the same, but mm -hmm. I tend to shine more and I do better and I like my work more when it is someone who's willing to be a little more daring with their design. So I think professionally my website looks good, but stylistically there's probably a lot of people who go there and think she's not for me. But the people who go there and see that I have a can't hardly wait reference gif from the 90s, mm -hmm. they're going to be like, oh my gosh, she's so funny. I need to work with her. <laughs> yeah. So I think, but also I made my own gif, which is like totally profesh, even though it's of so Kenny cool. talking about, do you like can't hardly wait? Am oh my I gosh, like it's been years. It's been years okay. since I've seen it. You know, the one Seth Green is the guy who's, oh baby, you are far too fun. I make a joke <laughs> about like templates. I'm like, you're far too fun to be using those templates or something like that. And Love I just it. think I'm in my own little world. Even my husband's like, are people going to get it? I'm like, the people who are going to get it are going to get it. Yeah. And the people who, even if you don't get every reference on my website, as long as you're like, oh, that's that 90s movie. That's funny. Or there's mm -hmm. people who are like, I don't even know what this girl is talking about. I'm out of here. And I'm like, okay. Both are valuable. Being able to be that model for your clients, you show up as yourself. You trust yourself to lead your business in the right direction. And that's a big, powerful thing to show up as that model for yourself and for other people. I'm curious what kinds of things you hear from your clients about hesitations or questions they have about how to embrace who they are in terms of the visuals. The copy, we can try and infuse copy with brand personality and with little references like you were just talking about. But mm -hmm. with the visuals, how do you bring in a person's personality into their visuals? I think you're like the first person to know this. I think I'm <laughs> stumbling on my new framework. Ooh. But I find that a lot of times when I work with people, we almost have to, people come to me with branding they love, but sometimes we have to go back and rework it because I am an outsider artist designer. I do not operate like normal, quote unquote, branding people. So I do help people with branding, but I, as I was saying before, don't really go into ideal client. I want your brand to just be about you. And I think mm -hmm. some people listening would be like, oh my God, let's, uh, we're going to fight. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I want to find somebody about that. But for me personally, when I started really embracing who I am and showing up in that way, that is when my business really started growing. And it was a little bit scary because, like I said, some people might be turned off by it. But what was happening was maybe some people were turned off, but the people who were connecting with it were really connecting with it. So I meet with people and maybe I go to do some design work and they send me over their hex codes or color codes and fonts and stuff. And they say, but I don't really like that cursive font. I don't use that. Or here's my colors, but I hate the red. I never use the red. And I'm like, okay, red flag. First of all, you need to love all your colors. You need to love all your, what do you want? How come you don't have, and a lot of times it's somebody they worked with who was like, you can't have more than three colors or you have to have this and this, and mm. you should have this, this font goes with this font or what it's like rules. What I do is say, what do you want? And then if they're going to make, I always tell my clients, if you're going to make a huge mistake, I will let you know. <laughs> but a lot of stuff is going to be fine. There could be some contrast problems and some accessibility problems with picking colors and what could go with what. I help them through that. But I just let them have a chance to say, I really want this or I like this and I hate orange. I don't care about this color psychology or whoever I'm trying to reach or whatever. If you don't like orange, it's going to be really hard for you to show up confidently and be like, here I am, world with a color I hate. Like, it's just not, <laughs> this is not going to work. My brand colors are picked from a swimsuit I bought for my daughter when she was like three years old at Target. And we were leaving Target. It was a mermaid bathing suit with the rainbow of colors and okay. shimmery gold. And I was leaving and I was thinking, I wish these could be my brand colors. Because before that time, I was doing what I was supposed to do. I had some pink, like clearly pink. Pink is my a signature color. Just like, what's her name? Who's Legally Blonde? Reese Witherspoon. Oh, Reese Witherspoon. But Elle Woods. Yes. Elle Woods. Elle Woods. <laughs> I'm like, what's her name? And so I had some pink in there, but mostly I was keeping it perfect. Like you said, professional. Because I was like, okay. Because at that point, I really wanted to get out of teaching. So I felt pressure to make this work. And I felt like you were saying you're a B student or whatever. I'm a rebel, but I'm also a rule follower. I like to learn things. I like to know how I'm supposed to do things. So when I entered online business and I would read blogs or take courses or something, people were like, this is what you have to do. Especially if they were like, I made a bajillion dollars doing this and this. Then I was like, oh my God, cool. I want a million dollars. I guess I have to do this, this, and this. Sign me up. Give me my homework and I'll do it. And I just wasn't showing up as myself. And there was a huge disconnect between my real life Deanna, my online Deanna. And I was like, people online just don't know how funny I am. They don't know how funny I am. They don't know how creative I am. I was like, 
that's what people say about me usually in in IRL in real life. They say I'm either funny or creative or both. And I was like, nobody's getting that online at all. Mm. Mostly the funny part. I was like offended. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. People don't know that I'm funny. And so then I was walking out of Target that day being like, oh, wait, why can't these be my brand colors? I'm the boss. I just mm-hmm. let, you know, I want to leave this job where my principal sucks and they're bossing me around. They're awful. I want to be the boss. So I will make these my brand colors. So I went home, got on the Target website, found the actual picture from the website, brought it into Photoshop and got my color codes. And they have been, my daughter's going into second grade. So for an ADHD person, so pick those colors and stick with them for that long. It's because I have every color. <laughs> I don't need any more. I got them all. So it's fine. And there's some that pop up more than others. But I usually tell people, let's pick lots of colors. And then if you ever do need a yellow, this will be your yellow. Because mm-hmm. what I find is they get a couple rules from a brand designer. Then they go in Canva and they're like, oh, I just need a green. I'm just going to grab whatever green I want because then they're on their own. So mm-hmm. I set them up to break the rules, but then make their own rules. I love that. I find a lot of my clients are stuck in that place of this is what I'm supposed to do. This is what I was told I was supposed to do, or I should do this. Mm -hmm. And I just hate that. It feels so safe and so generic. And I know it's vulnerable to step outside of that. Finding that ideal client, that soul sister client on the other side who sees you for who you are and says, look, I want to work with you because I know who you are and I know you get me. That is such a powerful transformation. So what would you say to somebody who's stuck in that safe or generic place that should be professional space? What has your experience been like once you have embraced those colors and that way of showing up as yourself? What would you say to a person who's really hesitant to step into that? First of all, I would ask, is it working for you? I think maybe some people are okay with this is what I should do. And if you don't care about I honestly don't care about my colors. I don't care about my fonts. What do you think I should do? You hired someone and that's what you want to do. And you are not in Canva being like, oh, I wish I could use this font, but I can't. That's not my thing. If you're cool with it and if you're making money, then keep doing it. Mm -hmm. If you hate it, but you're making a lot of money, maybe experiment a little with changing it in a way to where you can infuse a little more of your personality into it. But I don't Mm -hmm. want you to just throw away everything. If you're good and you're like, yes, making money, doing my thing. But it's tugging at you. I would dip your toe in the pool and see what's up. Mm. If you are not happy with how you're showing up and you're not making money, get a virtual trash can, (laughs) throw it all away, and just do a cannonball right into what do you want to do and try it for 30 days, 60 days. Just break all the rules and just see what happens. Because it's like you were just saying, when you can connect with someone, it doesn't have to be like, oh, I'm wacky and I have pink hair and it's fun and funny. I am not personally a religious person, but when people show up and talk about Jesus, that's another thing that I think of because I feel like with tattoos and pink hair, it's, oh, I don't want to be edgy, but what could you connect with someone on? So Mm -hmm. me personally, I don't think I would definitely immediately be like, oh, that's not my person if they started talking about Jesus. But I feel like if I had a strong relationship with Jesus and they did, then I might be like, oh, wow, cool. This is a designer who also knows what's up. Or right now my family has been budgeting a lot. So if someone started talking about budgeting for some weird reason. My weekly emails are all over the place with stories that usually, I won't say every time, (laughs) relate back to business. Mm -hmm. So if someone started talking about how they were on a budget, I would feel connected to them. I would want to hit reply and be like, oh my God, girl, I'm on a budget too. So annoying, gosh, (laughs) adulting and saving for the future is so annoying. I just want to do what I want to do now. Yeah. So even just throwing in little pieces of your personality, also, I think a safe way to do this is also sharing any photos of your past. Mm -hmm. Now I want to find that picture that was the fake picture that we took on the hike. But I have shown pictures of me going to prom in 99. And in that email, I talk about how I was self-conscious about my weight. And I look at the picture and I'm like, lots of people probably relate to this. You're like, oh my God, why was I self-conscious then? Now 42, two babies later, I'm like, what was I thinking? (laughs) But people who read that are going to connect with that if they do. There could be people who read that and go, what is this girl talking about? I signed up for marketing advice, not (laughs) diet culture slamming. And they're not my people because two weeks ago, I sent an email about how my three-year-old son stuck a beat up his nose. (laughs) Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I got some unsubscribes because people are probably like, all right, it's too much. I don't care about the beat up your kid's nose. But I also got like 10 or 15 replies to that email being like, oh my gosh, been there. Goal is real, blah, blah. And it was an email about not DIYing it. <laughs> my husband grabbed a toothpick and I was like, I'm 
my god, did not put a toothpick up his nose trying to get me out. So we talked. I was just talking about how the professional got it out very yeah. quickly, and it was fine. So it was just like a funny little story and an email. Mm-hmm. But so many moms on my list were like, "Oh my gosh, this is so funny." So even just infusing some of your personality, and I just totally did ADHD thing and looped around, but. Sharing old pictures, I think, a little bit safe because it's not really you anymore. Obviously, that was still me at prom, but it was a way to tell a story now. And actually, that email, I also shared a photo of my grandma and my mom because that's where I learned some of that stuff about diet culture and ended with a picture of me pregnant with my daughter with my husband. And so people feel like they know me, but it's it wasn't like changing my brand color. So technically, I guess what I'm saying is email could be a fun place to experiment with what I call letting your freak flag fly. But it doesn't always have to be freaky. When you're freaking yeah. like that. I love that. I love that. I always tell my clients to try something yes. in Instagram stories. It doesn't have to live forever. It doesn't have to become a regular thing. It doesn't have to be a series that you do every week. Mm-hmm. If you want to show the gallery wall in your living room because you're really proud of it, cool, show that. And yeah. maybe that opens a door for you. Maybe somebody comments and says, oh, cool, I really love this. And that opens a door for you, at least a door to conversation, to connection. And who knows what might happen down the road, right? But showing pieces of yourself, even if you're not comfortable showing up as your face on stories, talking Mm -hmm. to the camera, there are opportunities to showcase who you are and to step outside Mm -hmm. of that, ooh, should I do this? Should I not? I'm paralyzed in indecision. There Mm -hmm. are pieces and parts of you that everyone wants to relate to and to just showcase that in any way you can. I love that you said that because actually I just feel like I've been talking about my kids a bunch. I don't know what's going on. I guess they're around me 24-7, so they're on my brain. But they're needy, and they say my name a lot, so I'm going to say their names a lot on this. Just kidding. <laughs> but it's funny you said that because I don't show pictures of my kids. Mm-hmm. So I do talk about them. I think I probably say their names sometimes. I don't know. I just started feeling, and I did it a lot in the beginning because I thought that's what I should do because there's yeah. certain marketers that are like my five ideas for what I was going to share on Instagram. So I was using them a lot more back when I first started. And then I was just like, I don't think I'm going to use them. No shade or anything to people who do. I think it's totally fine. I'm just not doing that right now. And who knows? It it could change. I don't know. It's really hard sometimes. I'm like, oh, they're so cute. I'm robbing the world of their cute little faces. But (laughs) it is like sometimes. But I do tell their story. So maybe my son will grow up and be like, I can't believe you sent an email about the time I put a beat up my nose. And some people might not even share the story. So you get to pick. I love that you just said that. My point is you get to choose how much you want to share and what you want to share or how you want to share it. So Mm -hmm. I think just feeling like you're in charge, just letting people. And also, I think leading by example, if you are in my world and you're seeing me do it, then I think it paves the way to make it feel a little safer for other people. Yeah, absolutely. Is there a certain tool or concept or idea that you walk through with your clients to try and help them figure out, okay, how do I want to show up? The key question of what do you want is a big starting point for you. I know you mentioned that, but Have you had a client that's really decided, okay, this is how I want to show up, and there was a a turning point for them? What happened as a result? What are the pieces you walk through with your client? I love that. To be honest, like I was saying, I really, it's funny because I also talk about niching down is not, like, in my mind, it's so annoying. I don't like it. The ADHD in me does not like it. I fought against it. But as I, let me say really fast. Niching down in the beginning before you have real clients to understand your ideal avatar when you're just making it up to me feels like I don't even know. Okay, I'll just make up answers because I'm a good student. I'll just make up stuff. Now that I've been doing this for a few years, the ideal client can be a real person that I'm thinking of. Ooh, that was really fun working with her. I want to do more and more of that. And that is how I've realized that the personal branding, the people who are their brands, service providers, consultants, coaches, if you're going to be client facing, Like I was saying, you can't false advertise. Like those are my people because I have struggled helping people with products or even with maybe just a membership that they don't really want to be that in charge. I think it could be also a personal brand who does a membership, but there's been a few people where it's been hard for me to navigate that because I'm like, okay, yeah, I guess we do need to think about your ideal client. Like, I guess we do need to like do all those things that other branding people do (laughs) that I don't because what I really, I feel like my zone of genius is in helping pull out what you really want. So it really is just about getting on Zoom with people, like boxering with people and just talking and talking. One person was like, I don't think I want any colors. Can I have no colors? And I was like, like, obviously I'm the rainbow lady over here. I'm like mermaid bathing suit. I'm like, 
I think you can. Let's look at it. Let's work through it. Let's figure it out. And I also just get on a call usually with my people. And I say it's like the eye doctor because I will be like this one or this one, like this red or this, like this pink Mm -hmm. or this pink. And then we just keep going until we figure it out. And that's where I was telling you too, that I won't let them do anything terrible. I'm like, don't worry. None of these options are wrong. If you start to lean towards something wrong, I will steer us back onto a path where I might say you can't quote unquote, you can't. See, even as an art teacher, I'm like, you can do whatever you want, to be honest. But But maybe I wouldn't do that. So I think really just listening to who they are. I talk about too, like ideal client, avatar. You never start a new job and you're not like, okay, I need to figure out my ideal friend avatar. Okay, I'm a teacher now. What kind of teachers do I want to be friends with? Only the resource teachers. I come from high school for a while, then elementary school. So that I was last in elementary school, but I wasn't like, okay, I'm only gonna be friends with resource teachers. I do not want to be friends with, I wasn't like, okay, how should I show up to school? What should I wear? How should I act to attract my ideal friend avatar? Mm -hmm. No, I just showed up and I was me. And I'm sure some people were like, she's whack. And some people, my friends who I go to happy hour with (laughs) were like, oh my God, we love her. She's hilarious. She's fun. So I was like, why do you have to do that thing in business? If you are going to be working with the people, why, why would we figure out how we need to show up and what we need to look like? And I just think it puts so much pressure on you and then you can't show up like a human and then people don't want to work with you because they're like, what's that weird? That person seems like really nervous and it just isn't going to connect. I don't think unless you just drop all the stuff and just show up as you and Talk about the thing you're doing, because I'm assuming if you started a business, a photography business or whatever, you love doing what you're doing. So just show up as you and talk about it. That's all we're doing in the business is just saying, hey, I do this cool thing. Do, would you like to do it with me? Then here's how much it costs. And I feel like we just overcomplicate that so much. And when I stopped doing that and I just started being like, here's me. I can make your graphics. <laughs> would you like some? <laughs> and then pricing's difficult. And I started really low on my pricing and I've just bumped it up because it was scary to me. And I'm like a punk at heart. And I'm like, oh, worked through some anti-capitalism. Like I've been working right. on some stuff, but you can tweak that. But just getting in front of people and being like, here's me. I can help you. Yeah. Do you want to give me some money and I'll do it? <laughs> That's all we have to do. And it, it can be more complicated, but it doesn't have to be. I love that. When you were talking about showing up as a teacher and being like, who do I want to be friends with? It reminds me of like my very first year of teaching. When I was a teaching assistant, I showed up first day with a blazer on, a black blazer. And I was like super serious, bought me a new purse, walked in real serious. And then I fast forward six weeks and I was teaching poetry and I showed up all boho and feeling like just really earthy. And then my students are like, and eventually I found my myself and my zone (laughs) Mm -hmm. and I'm just I'm a skinny jeans and cute little top type of person as a teacher Mm -hmm. that's my jam but I had to try on all of these you should be like this if you teach English you should be like this as a young teacher I had to try all those on and I think that having that experience before heading into business ownership really helped me because I wasn't about trying things on anymore I was about, okay, now that it's my zone, now that I know me, how can I show up in that way? Mm -hmm. And that's not to say I didn't make mistakes along the way. I sure did. I didn't show up as authentically as I wanted, but I'm here now and I'm doing what I want now. And I'm living out the way I want to live now. And it's such a relief to offload that pressure off your shoulders. That is a really good thing. Yeah. And then you can, I don't know, concentrate on your work. <laughs> yeah. It's like you don't have to put so much effort into how you're showing up online. You can just show up online, film your reel. It yeah. does put so much pressure. Like you're saying, it's so much easier to do when you're just... And from a copywriting standpoint, I just write how I write. Oh, yeah. that saves you so much time rather than having to be like, I'm writing an email. How do I sound <laughs> on my email? I'm just like, oh my God, y'all. I can't, my kid stuck a beat up his nose. Can you believe yeah. it? So... I think it just, it'll save you time, especially if you feel like you're always already spending too much time, which I feel like we all feel like we are. Yeah, absolutely. Especially if we're juggling multiple things. I have kids too, and they're home all the time in the summer. And it's just like, when I get a moment to work on my business, 
I don't want to have to like put on all of these things and show up as a certain person. I can just be me and I can connect with my audience that way. And it's a relief. It's a relief yeah. for sure. Think about, I feel like everybody loves Brene Brown. Who doesn't, mm-hmm. who doesn't love Brene Brown? But she's not what I would think of as like a researcher or talk right. about, I don't like data. She does, yeah. but she's cool about it because she just shows up and she's cussing and being funny and telling stories that are relatable to me. Yeah. And I don't know, there might be like data research people who are like, she is so unprofessional, <laughs> but I think her books and stuff, she's doing okay. You know what yeah. I mean? So I think, I she's think doing okay. <laughs> yeah. And I just think it's so much more fun and easy yeah. to stick with. People are always talking about consistency. The easier it is and the more fun it is, probably the, the easier more to maintain, have right? Consistency. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I love that. Okay. I want to talk a little bit about your Steal This course and your F That series. So you start where you want. I just want to get inside your brain a little bit and have you tell the audience what it's about and how these are pieces of what it means to show up as you are. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Here we go, y'all. I told you I was a rebel. So we're going to go into the in you deeper into the rebel trove is that a word i don't know you're the word person i'm like is that a thing treasure trove it's yeah good. i'm like where do rebel I trove that? go yeah. go with it love all it all right oh my gosh branding yes okay so let's talk about let's talk about steal this course first so we've been talking about our journeys so when i first came on the scene in the online business world i took a lot of courses because i was like okay i'm just a teacher i don't know how to why did I think I didn't know how to teach people online? I was literally had been a teacher for over a decade, but I was like, this is different. It's online. It's whatever. So I fell into some funnels. One of the people in the course says, but fell into a few funnels, got some courses that I definitely regretted. And now I'm like, "Eh, it's part of my story. It's fine. But like, essentially I spent $2,000 on a course while my husband was in the hospital. I was pregnant with our second kid. I was a teacher. He was a line cook. So there was like not a ton of money sitting in our bank account. So me spending that without asking him, but I had to do it because the bonuses and the doors were closing and I just, he was at the hospital. It was his fault. He was at the hospital. I couldn't ask him. Just kidding. And I did that. And I just remember telling him and him being like, he wasn't mad at me, but he was like disappointed. It was like that thing parents do. And he was like, it's almost worse. Oh, so heartbreaking. So (laughs) awful. And uh, like we were saying before, I'm a good student. I did the work. Turns out I didn't get the beautiful dreams that were promised to me. I was going to say on the infomercial, on the webinar, which is similar to an infomercial, I feel like, right, right. shade. I fell for it. I got a little duped and did it a few more times along the way. That was my first one. And then there was a few more. And so I just keep seeing people in my community, on my email list, whatever, getting sucked into these funnels too. And I'm like, okay, y'all, you don't need, like I was just saying, we don't have to overcomplicate it. You mm-hmm. don't really need to know a lot, to just say, I have this thing that's really cool. Do you want it? And just yeah. give me some money and I'll make it for you. Uh, and all the sales pages tell us like, it could be amazing and we'll be drinking pina coladas on the beach and we won't even have to work. And like all this money is just gonna roll in and it's gonna be amazing. It's gonna happen in two seconds. And all we have to do is put in our credit card information. Yep. So I made Steal This Course based off the book from the seventies called Steal This Book. Uh, it might be sixties. I could be miss whatever, calculating. And it was, it's just a middle finger at this whole idea that all these courses are selling you. Now, I am a teacher, so I like learning. And I'm not saying you don't have to buy any courses. I just want people to stop buying all the courses or stop buying courses that you don't need and feel a little bit more in charge of their buying. So it's an audio course. It's just walks you through my story, like a little bit more in depth than what I just said. And then we did an online Zoom call with no pictures and fake names for an hour. And we I called it the online business shame show. And people showed up and really shared their stories about things they'd fallen for and what had happened to them. And so I thought it would be fun for people, not fun. Oh, look at all our shame. It's so hilarious. <laughs> Bringing it back to Brene Brown. But yeah. if you hear other people talk about it, number one, you can release like your shame and be like, okay, cool. That wasn't just me. I wasn't a ding dong. This funnel was set up to do this. And then just some different like activities and workbooks to figure out next time you're on a sales page, do I really need this? Most of the time the answer is no. But anyway, so it's funny. I think it's funny because I'm punk. It's $9 or there's a button where you can just steal it and get it for free. (laughs) I'm like, if you've been burned too many times, take this. I got you. Like it's too much. Yes. So that's the steal this course. And I think what I hope it does is help people realize they already have in them most of the things that they need to succeed. They just need to learn a few things here and there that honestly, I'm like, y'all, it's mostly on Google. Just yeah. Google it. <laughs> Google, Google it, YouTube it, <laughs> ask somebody you trust. <laughs> yes. Honestly, this speaks to me so much. I didn't 
fall victim to very many courses at the beginning, but I certainly felt like, okay, I'm trained as an educator, as a writer, as a teacher. I don't know how to do business. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to do a profit and loss. I don't know how to do the mathy stuff. Yeah. And I hid behind a lot of those courses that I would mm -hmm. purchase, even about the mathy stuff, to just tell myself, once I do this, I will feel legit. And it's like, that legitimate feeling doesn't come from a course. It doesn't come from a purchase. It comes from finding that within yourself and trusting yourself. And oh man, did it take a long time for me to finally shed that mindset and be like, you know what? I have everything in me that I need to be successful. If I don't know how to do a profit and loss, I can either hire somebody to do it or I can figure it out on my own. But I don't need to live in that scarcity of I'm not equipped to do this well. I don't yes. need to live there. I started feeling, and maybe some people have felt this way, once you start, and it doesn't even have to be something you paid for, but like downloading free PDFs, mm -hmm. even Googling every single thing you do, I feel like you don't realize that it's happening and it happened to me. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh my gosh, every time I want to do anything in my business, I'm immediately feeling like I don't know how to do it and someone needs to tell me how to do it. Mm -hmm. And so trading in one boss for anyone who wrote a blog on the internet was my new boss. Yeah. Instead of just sitting down and being like, okay, I need to, I'm going to do this course. So what do I need to do? As a, just as a 42 year old person in the world, I have to figure out what I'm teaching. I have to figure mm -hmm. out a way to get their money and I have to figure out a way to give them what they just paid me for. Literally. <laughs> that's it. But I feel like, yeah. yeah. And so what are you going to do? Thrive cart, convert kit. There's some choices you have to make. And then that's where sure. maybe YouTube or a small course or a membership or something like that could come in handy. But I was just feeling like I couldn't make a decision until I Googled it and made sure I was doing it correctly. And yeah. there's so many different ways that people have built businesses that are successful that you don't need to buy a course. And I feel like it was all new business owners who were just digging themselves deeper and deeper into debt. Right. Which is just making it so much harder to have a profitable business because everything you're doing is putting you in the negative and making decisions on things that don't even matter until we get some clients. Just right. go back to have a thing. Do you want to buy it? Can I have some money? Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then worry about it as you go. Because even like... People are, oh, what should I price it? How should I price it? How should I price it? Buying courses on how to price it. I'm like, just price it. And if you price it wrong, you could just fix it. Cause yeah. like right now there's no one on your email, barely anyone on your email list. Yeah. Like it's not gonna be like you said in stories. I talked a lot in the stories and sold a lot in the stories when I first started. I just called them experiments. And I was like, does anybody want a gif? They're 20 yeah. bucks. And I made a bunch of gifts and I was like, 20 bucks is not enough. I'm drawing <laughs> custom drawings for people on my iPad. I'm like, okay, this is not sustainable. Let's either bump it up or rethink it. But that's the way I learned. And guess what? People were giving me $20. So even though it wasn't like enough, it felt really good that I was like, oh my God, people are paying me money. Because <laughs> yeah. before, before that, I was spending money on courses and not actually getting money from any clients. And it does give you that confidence boost. Even if you know the pricing might be a little off, you're still like, oh my God, I have clients. And you can I like- I did the thing. Yeah. yeah. And you can tweak your systems and your pricing. And as you go- and the people who really like you will be along for the ride the whole time. And then right. those are like your big, awesome those are your fans. People. Yes. Yeah. So they are those amazing. Are people. I yeah. love that. Okay. Tell us about your F That series. Okay. So F That is a private podcast series that I do that just invites entrepreneurs to come on and tell their story of a time in their business when they were doing one thing and they like stopped for a second and decided, F That. I'm going to do it this way. Mm. I've done a few different seasons of it right now. We're going to have one coming up soon. I think. I'm not sure the date. I can't say it. My ADHD brain won't let me say it. I don't know, but I'm working behind oh, the scenes on a little something. Mm -hmm. But we've done it before. Like one season was all about social media. One mm -hmm. season was all for podcasters, how they break the rules on podcasting. Now the next time I do it, it's going to be like, it's not in jeopardy. They call it potpourri. <laughs> no, <laughs> like we're not going to do like a, we're going to do one category. We're just going to have some people on talking about how they break the rules. Because I think sometimes, like I was just saying, I think all the worksheets and the PDFs and the rules can stifle your own creativity and quiet your own voice of how you want to run your business. But I think hearing people's stories about what they did can really spark your mind to be like, yeah. oh my gosh, that's cool. I want to do something like that. So it's on the landing page. I say it's kind of like a summit, but not. There's no yeah. workbooks. There's no upsell. It's totally free. And again, that's my punk rock little DIY person. I'm like, why does my punk rock side want to give away everything for free? But I'm like, that's all right. It's all right. I got you. So it's free. There's no upsells. There's no workbooks, no slideshows. It's just, they're pretty short too. It's 10 minute, 15 minute stories of what someone was doing and then what they do now so that you can start to feel like, 
yeah, I don't like doing that either. Why do I do that? All the shoulds, like you were saying. So that's a fun little series I do. And I just get a spunky little attitude for F that. Yeah, I love that so much. I think that (laughs) we all have moments in life, whether it's in business or just in personal life, where it's, you know what? Why am I doing it this way? (laughs) Why am I overcomplicating this? Why am I stuck here? Why am I doing this just because that's the way I've always done it? And Mm -hmm. I love that you're giving voice and giving permission to people to listen in on those stories and say, are you doing this? If you are stuck, just say F that and move on. Do it different. Thank you so much for being here. I loved our conversation and I'm so excited to see how all of the people that listen will take this conversation and really use it as that armor that they need to go in and be who they are and just shed all of the shoulds and really embrace who they are. So thank you so much for being here. Shed the shoulds. I like that. Put on a t-shirt. I like that. Yeah, girl. Love it. Okay. (laughs) All righty. I am sending a big virtual hug to Deanna for sharing her experience with the Copywriter On Call podcast today. Be sure to check out Steal This Course and her F That series. We will have the links for you in the show notes. As always, thank you so much for listening. And until next time, this is your Copywriter On Call signing off. Thanks for listening to the Copywriter On Call podcast. If this episode has you feeling all sorts of inspired to show up as yourself online, click that subscribe button so you don't miss my stories or practical advice to help you express your quirky, vulnerable, and authentic self online. Chat soon.